Hello everyone, Hyper here, and today will be the first video in the Big Dumb Strategy series, where we will be covering Lady Ashvane. We decided to skip the first three bosses because they're kind of trivial at this point, but if you are struggling on one of those first three bosses, then you can go ahead and ask questions either in the comments section or a better place would be in my Discord, which is linked below, and I'll try to help out as much as I can. Since this is the first video in the series, we're constantly looking for feedback and ways to improve. We've never really recorded anything like this in the past, so if you have any suggestions, uh, make sure to leave them in the comments below. Today, I am joined by Lozi, the GM of BDG, to talk about tanking, and Shampi, the healing officer, is here as well to help out with some healing tips. We'll basically break down the fight segment by segment, uh, going over strategy, DPS, healing, and tanking. But to get us started, we'll start off with the overall strategy. The first thing you want to decide when making the strategy is whether or not you're going to two-phase versus three-phase. Uh, I think for the most part, you should plan to three-phase, uh, but you can take a look at your DPS, see if you can do about 800k rate DPS during the exposed phases, and that's about the amount of damage you have to do for the two-phase. The two-phase does require more raid DPS overall, um, but it is going to be a shorter fight. It's going to be less stress on the healers. Uh, generally speaking, you can drop a um, tank or a healer as well to compensate. One thing that also changes with the two-phase and three-phase strategy is whenever you lust. So with the two-phase, you're going to be looking at lusting at about four minutes. Um, because that's about when you're going to be breaking the second shield, whereas with the three phase, you're going to be pushing that lust more to six minutes, which is around where you break the last shield. Um, but with the three phase, it's way more important to push that lust to later in the fight because the la those last few minutes become super punishing um, because you have so many debuffs on the raid and so much is happening. Right, and not only that, you just kind of need the damage to push out of the third shielded phase. Because uh, with the three phase, you, you don't need as much damage during the exposed phases, so lessening the shielded phases makes sense there. Um, I'm talking about individual mechanics a little bit. So, Briny Bubble is one of the big ones. Um, basically, positioning them always in cleave range of the boss, because... You, you'll have passive cleave from like fire mages, demon hunters, DKs, almost every class at this point has some sort of passive cleave. Um, and them being in range of the boss most of the time, like having a stack point for it is uh, fairly important. One thing to note about brownie bubbles is that you can immune them with uh, mage block or DK AMS. One thing from the healer's perspective that you can do is if you have a Holy Priest, they can take Conflict and Strife as a major in their essence and use Holy Ward to essentially immune off other people. And that's really effective for Holy Priests and a reason to bring them on this fight if you have one available. You do want to be careful with immuning these, though. Uh, I know the, the tendency is to just kind of like use it right away. But like for the example, like during your first shield phase, you absolutely like don't need to immune these. That's better saved for later in the fight. Even though it's not a guarantee that you're going to get it again, uh, definitely having them up for later times, especially to expose phases uh, for either strat is, is the play. One thing to note about Coral Cutting that's in, the, in terms of damage taken is the uh, arcing current that shoots through you and your partner. Is, uh, it does a lot of damage, and you can cleave the raid who are standing in the middle. If you aren't uh, heads up about where you're putting your your link, also if you're cutting the coral, when the coral gets cut, it does a it shoots out a little little bit of shrapnel that does AOE damage. So those two things can kill you if you're low, especially if you have waterlog stacks. So we actually had a lot of deaths. Still have deaths to people getting double cut. Um, people who are both firing a laser and standing in the path of someone else's. Really, this it's it's on everyone. It's on the entire raid to like if you're in the middle of the room, you're in a danger zone, almost guaranteed. Uh, so just make sure you're positioning yourself in a way that is safe and not ignoring the mechanic just because you don't have a debuff. And then once you get to the last exposed phase where you're not cutting anymore, it helps to kind of move close to your partner. 
so there's no people between you and them, just to kind of reduce the damage taken. So with uh, Rippling Waves, this is going to be another thing that uh, your DPS kind of determines how many you have to soak. Uh, with three-phase strat, you need to make plans for probably at least nine waves. Uh, it's, it's worth noting that ideally the last wave of every shielded phase is just going into the boss. Uh, you can soak close ones, but actually kiting the boss away from bubbles when you're close to pushing is better. Those bubbles will hit the boss. Uh, we're calling the bubbles waves. Uh, will hit the boss while the boss is exposed, so it doesn't actually regenerate shield. It still does the raid damage, but it removes the dot from your raid. Uh, as if if you're doing a three tank strat, you want to put as many of these debuffs as you can onto third tank, uh, which is pretty much all of them. So they will soak. So generally, it's the first wave of every exposed phase, and then they die on the second one. But this is just another thing where like you gotta look at your damage and like if you're gonna skip certain waves, you know how to like move cooldowns around. I think um for Prague we did two, three, four, and our third tank died on both the the third wave of the second shield phase and the second wave of the third shielded phase. So for all the other ones that aren't going into your third tank and aren't going into your boss, you need to put those stacks just on raid in general. The the primary one here being the first wave on the third shielded phase. And those stacks go on people who either A, are tanky, uh, or B, that heal themselves a lot. So this would be like primarily healers. Um, melee are like generally pretty tanky, but bubbles generally don't make it that far. And then with the two-phase strat, it's a lot more straightforward because you have way less ways to deal with. You basically just have your first wave going to tank. Second wave is most likely going to go into a boss because you should be breaking the shield by that point. If not, your DPS can pick up some of the close ones. Uh, but basically all of the waves during the shield phases will go into the tanks. And it's up to you really if you want to put all the stacks onto one tank or if you can split them between the two. Um, but essentially, once you get to the last wave, that's towards the end of the fight, at that point, you can have some on the raid because there's not that much time left. So basically, you want two, two waves of debuff split on your two tanks, or just go on one tank, and then one wave of debuff go split on the raid. If you do decide to do the three tank strategy, where you suicide a tank to soak a, an entire wave set, but obviously the debuffs will be too high and they just have to kill themselves, um, what we did was we ended up resurrecting a tank and then they come up on the third shield phase, second wave set, and then they just try and collect as many of those bubbles as they can. If you do that, you need to assign heavy healing cooldowns because that's a lot of uh, damage that you're putting onto the raid in quick succession and you can lose a lot of people very quickly if you do that. Okay, for the next segment, it will be DPS or damage. Um, basically, how you should be using your damage cooldowns, how you should be spacing everything out. It changes quite a bit between the two phase and the three phase strategy because in the two phases, uh, you are you need a lot more damage in the exposed phases of the boss whenever she's not shielded, just because you're trying to essentially kill her two minutes or three minutes quicker than you would normally. For the two-phase strategy, you basically want to hold all your cooldowns until the first shield break, which is at about one minute. So classes with shorter cooldowns than that, or slightly longer, so for example, Frost DK's uh, Pillar of Frost, which is 45 seconds, or Fury Warriors, Fury Warriors, which is a minute and 30, you can pop those on pool because they will still be up during the exposed phase and you only get one use. Now with two minutes and three minute cooldowns, you will just use them whenever the shield breaks um, for the first time and then whenever the shield breaks for the second time which is at around four minutes which is where you will also be lusting there's a few damage cooldowns that you might want to consider holding even after the shield break such as combustion because you do get one set of briny bubbles during the exposed phases so if you have a super short cooldown um, like combustion only lasts 10 seconds and does a ton of damage if you hold that for the bubble that's going to help out a lot with just getting passive damage on them 
to help free those people out uh, without really losing any boss damage. Now, with the three-phase strategy, it changes quite a bit. Uh, most classes will be a little more liberal with, with their cooldown use because you do need to make damage checks both in the exposed phase and during the shield phase because you don't want to spend too much time in the shield phases uh, because you will be getting way too many waves and that's going to put too much stress on your raid overall. So with this strategy, you're essentially going to be spacing out your cooldowns with certain players holding their cooldowns until the first shield break and those are typically going to be like two minute cooldown players, whereas people with three minute cooldowns or short cooldowns can go ahead and use them on pull. Um, and with this strategy, you are going to be basically spreading out your damage on the boss a lot more overall. So the damage checks with the three phase strategy are pretty straightforward. You essentially want to do the first shield in one bubble wave. You want to do the second shield in about two waves and you are most likely going to be getting the third wave as you push the boss um, and like Lozi mentioned you can kite the boss away from those bubbles just to get a little extra time to push her if she's not close to pushing then you'll have to deal with that wave but um, making the DPS check will really take a lot of stress off your raid and then the third shield you'll most likely do in four waves and again the last set of waves can go either way where depending on your dps you will either need to soak a few of them and let the rest hit the boss once you face her or if you're a little bit behind on dps then you might actually have to soak all of them so that's really just going to come down to how much damage your raid is actually doing For the healing strategy on this fight, the biggest consideration that you have to make is actually how much DPS your raid is doing, because that is going to determine how much damage you're taking and how much healing is required of you. Um, as Ashvane causes waves of bubbles to spawn, she will increase them for each subsequent set of waves. For example, in the first set of waves, she will have five bubbles, and the wave after that will have seven bubbles, on and on and on. If you can skip wave sets, by having higher DPS, that will be the biggest factor in making the fight easier to heal for your team. You can also use a third tank to accumulate all of those waterlogged uh, debuffs and soak as many bubbles as possible uh, as one person so that you really only have to heal that one person as opposed to the entire raid soaking the bubbles and splitting the healing. Um, and that's just going to make it easier for healers. So if you do have the DPS to do a two-phase strategy, that means you can possibly drop the third tank and just two-tank it. Uh, also, it means that you could drop a healer and do a two-heal strategy even. So you can two-heal and two-tank and just have a ton of DPS and skip as many wave sets as possible. That, the benefit that that gives you is it means that there's a lot, less, a lot fewer waterlogged debuffs on the raid, so you're overall taking a lot less damage. Um, and it also means that you can be very liberal in your healing cooldowns because you're really only taking uh, about like four to six waves, probably fewer than that, probably about four or five waves, um, because the fight's going to be a lot shorter and you're going to be skipping sets. Um, most of the damage that you're going to be taking as a raid is going to be happening during the shield phases. Um, so what that means is you're going to be assigning healing cooldowns during the sets of rippling waves because that's going to be the most amount of damage happening to your raid in a very small window. So you want to make sure that uh, you have as many cooldowns as possible for the most dangerous time. And two phasing means that you can have more cooldowns for fewer uh, damage events. Also with a two phase strategy, your healers can be more aggressive on damage. If you do drop to a two heal strategy, you probably can't add a lot of damage because your healers have to uh, put a lot of that pressure on themselves and, and they don't have backup essentially. But if you do three heal with a two phase strategy, then your healers can do a lot of damage. They can go Crucible of Flame Major with Cyclotronics and things like that. If you do a three phase strategy, the damage that you take is going to be significantly higher, especially when you get to that final shield phase. Um, but uh, the reason that you would do a three-phase strategy is if you just don't have the DPS to meet that requirement. It's, it's harder to execute, but it has uh, a looser requirement, essentially, is, is the reason you would do a three-phase strategy. So 
healers that are very viable, and this is mainly relevant for three phasing, is uh, disc priests are exceptionally good, and holy holy pallies are exceptionally good. And the main reason for that is that they bring DRs, and uh, they do a lot of damage. And those two things are especially good on fights like Ashvane, uh, and and every fight in this tier. So your strategy as a healing team on this fight is going to be mainly uh, let healers who have cooldowns heal those waves while they have cooldowns rolling, and then everyone else does a lot of damage or does spot healing. And the benefit of a Disc Priest is that they can really have cooldowns running for every set of waves, and so your other healers can just focus on making sure that the people who maybe don't have atonement or something like that, or, or people who dip low or in a briny bubble, those people get spot healing that the Disc Priest just can't do. So the first few waves of each shield phase can be covered by smaller healing cooldowns, something like uh, just a couple of radiances from your Disc Priest or uh, you know, a, a Rapture or something like that, uh, a Healing Tide or a Revival, those, those smaller cooldowns that you're not too afraid to just throw out there. Uh, but the later waves in each shield phase, you want to have the more powerful cooldowns, especially if you do a three tank strategy where you plan to uh, resurrect a tank and then suicide them as they take uh, seven or nine uh, waves in quick succession. You want to have very powerful cooldowns for those later waves where people are more likely to die. So as mentioned, as you have more and more sets of rippling waves, uh, and more waterlogged debuffs out on the raid, healing is just going to ramp up and get increasingly difficult. So uh, as you get into those final waves in a three-phase strategy, you're going to want to double up on healing cooldowns, and also just be aware of uh, the upswelling that happens, and um, placing your area cooldowns, like a barrier or a link where people have to stand in a specific spot, just be aware of those upswells and placing it so that people can get in them. Uh, in terms of general healing tips, uh, the Ever Rising Tide Essence as a major essence is exceptionally powerful because it is a 30 second cooldown and the rippling wave sets happen exactly every 30 seconds. So you can have the Ever Rising Tide Essence for every single set of waves and the duration of that buff should be up for if not the entire uh, time that you'll be popping bubbles most of that time. For tanking in this fight, there's definitely two distinct roles. You're either kind of like a boss tank or, or a bubble tank. So like, you, for example, your third tank would definitely be bubble tank. Even in the two phase strat, you still have one tank that ends up taking more stacks than the other. Um, boss positioning in phase one is generally just against the wall, kind of as far back as you can get. This is because when she smashes you, leaves a giant pool of core on the ground, if you can get that just half outside the arena, better than being in the arena. Uh, it's also worth noting that you can stack this, which is why uh, you'll see tanks run back into already placed on ones. It doesn't take super hard. Um, don't stand in it forever, but it's definitely worth stacking, at least in this phase. Uh, it's also worth noting that tanks are always, always, always targets of Briny Bubble. Um, and since these are supposed to be in melee and generally stacked up, you can just drop a marker on yourself and have all the bubbles stack there. When you are taking smashes, you should kind of be mindful of what else is going on. Um, anytime you are taking your second smash in a row, you should think about using a cooldown. You don't always need it. If you topped, you know, it's not during a wave, you're probably going to be okay. But if there is any sort of like raid damage going on or if your health is, is getting lower, around like 50 or 70%, you should probably pop one just to make sure that you survive there. Uh, as a third tank in this fight, you're generally going to want to play more defensive rather than offensive. You don't actually need to tank anything. So if you're using somebody that has to switch specs, that's probably fine here. You can maybe do it on any class. I wouldn't recommend doing it on, like, a warrior. <laughs> but I think almost every other class kind of works out. Basically, you are there to soak bubbles or soak waves and stay alive. And to that end, you want to gout a lot more defensively. Uh, I would recommend picking up some speed pots. 
so you can soak bubbles fast, especially on if you are doing a third phase. There's two the 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 two waves that kill you have just a lot of bubbles in it. So if you speed pot, you can run over all of them because breaking bubbles isn't really the damage that kills you. It's just once the dot gets up to you mid to high teens, you're you're at risk of dying almost any second. And you should absolutely have either externals or personals for while soaking both of those sets, if not both. Um, the damage intake is is really high on you, and you're outputting a lot of it on the raid too. As a third tank, if you have a piece of gear with loyal to the end on it, it's good to take here in this fight, given that you're going to be dying at least twice. You can at least get that buff out on people. Tanking the exposed phases, uh, taunt swaps work a little bit differently than they do in phase ones. Since tanks are targets of cutters, we also taunt swap there along with taunt swapping for briny bubbles like you would in phase one. And another big thing in this phase is boss positioning. So since corals are all over the room, a lot of people that are, are close to the further cuts are generally going to prefer those if they get it, they get marked. So the boss needs to be a little bit more centralized. Um, stacking corals is nice because it saves room, but ultimately the boss needs to be in range almost the entire time, uh, which is why basically you can stack the first bash, and after that, we tend to pull the boss towards the center of the room. You can still kind of stack the bash, put it in the same general area, uh, but having the boss boss's body 20 yards towards the center of the room as opposed to being on the outside is a huge difference. That basically covers everything you need to know about Lady Ashvane, and a huge thanks to Lozi and Shampi for helping me out. If you have any questions um, or any tips that you want to share, make sure to leave them in the comment section because this video is meant to be a thread where we all help each other out to improve and progress further into this raid. Again, thank you so much for watching and if you enjoyed the video, make sure to hit the like button and sub to the channel. And if you want to see some healer gameplay or tank gameplay, you can also check out uh, Shampi's and Lozi's uh, Twitch, which are linked in the description box.